Welcome to Broad Eye, the podcast that explores knowledge gaps in ophthalmology and eye care. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Broad Eye Podcast. My name is Sean Maloney, and today I'm speaking with Anthony Ferrero. Anthony is a visually impaired athlete um, who's done uh, quite a number of things that we're going to dive into this conversation. So, Anthony, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, no, my, my pleasure is mine. So, um, we're going to talk about a number of a number of different facets, I guess, of of your life and whatnot. But I was hoping we could start off with just a a brief description of of your uh, eye condition. You know, what is it, and uh, when were you diagnosed, and maybe <clears throat> how that news was was received. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm the youngest of five. Um, I have two older brothers and two older sisters, and none of them have an eye condition. Uh, none of my my parents neither have an eye condition also i was born with um Leber's congenital amaurosis it's lca for short and it's an eye condition that has to do with i i don't research too much about it um to me it means that i'm blind but like uh so when i was it it attacks the retina i believe it has to do with that and like it's degenerative so when i was younger i had a little bit of sight where i could like see people and things and colors and like, you know, all this stuff. And, uh, slowly it degenerated, uh, like deteriorated over time. And when I was in high school, I lost a lot of sight and like eighth grade also. And, um, just remember losing a lot of vision growing up and it was like a weird thing. And now I'm just left with like light and shadows. And then, uh, sometimes in the perfect daylight, like outside in natural lighting, I can make out like shapes and, uh, shadows that are close up. Yeah, no fair. Um, before I talk about some of your athletic pursuits, um, well, this will lead into that, I guess, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, the film that, uh, that you're part of, of course, uh, called a shot in the dark, maybe just how that, how that came about and, uh, and, and, and any stories around that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, shot in the dark is, uh, my documentary. It's about my life as a blind wrestler. It's about uh, growing up, you know, overcoming challenges and uh, life obstacles and, you know, different adversity, you know, being blind. And it was really uh, documented my senior year of high school wrestling. And they followed, they followed me around all in real time. It was my brother, actually, um, my older brother, Oliver. He, he was also a wrestler and he was into film. <clears throat> he went to college for film. And he saw me dealing with you know different adversity like people not believing i was blind or saying i had unfair advantage because in wrestling i had to have a two-hand contact all the time so i knew where my opponent was and if we broke away we had to like start back in the center and you know people didn't like that and there was just different and i just like kind of tried to ignore it all and just keep doing my thing and my brother really was inspired by that and he took a little interview of me in my junior year talking about what it was like being blind growing up and, you know, just being a teenager basically and dealing with all this stuff and just living my life. And um, he posted it saying, you know, this is my little brother. I want to make a film about him. I don't have all the resources, blah, blah, blah. And um, my high school wrestling coaches, college wrestling teammate, uh, when they went to the same college together, he actually is into independent filmmaking and my uh, wrestling coach posted this video. So his friend reached out and said, you know, like, what's going on with this? Like, it seems like an amazing story. And him and my brother met up and decided to, you know, make a full feature length documentary of my senior year, and all independent, like out of pocket, self-funded and everything. And that's exactly what they did. And then the next uh my whole they captured everything my senior year followed me around everything and um after everything was over it kind of got put on the shelf for two years because uh i went to college my brother moved uh he bought a house and and the guy chris he uh had a kid so like life was happening and then in 2015 two years later it was taken off the shelf and chris put together the first 15 minutes and he like loved what he had And like, he was like, there's a great story here. You know, I got to tell this story. And he started working on the film and then was like excited to show my brother the first 15 minutes because, you know, they're working on it together. And the day before they were supposed to meet, my brother actually passed away. And 
at the age of 27 and he never got to see any of his film and it was like this whole you know just shock like to the world basically and it was like it's just out of nowhere and so unexpected and you know my big brother is like my hero and all this stuff and Chris actually came to his funeral and like vowed to me and my family like no matter what it takes I'm gonna finish this film for your brother for all of you blah blah, blah. and like he, that's exactly what he did and it was incredible like the next year and a half he just worked on this film and finished it and then you know put it on Kickstarter to raise the post production money so we like put thirty six thousand dollars as the goal and we actually needed more than that but chris was like i don't know how we're gonna raise this because you have 30 days to raise it and if you don't raise it all the money goes back and chris put it up the trailer for the film and like put the little story behind it what was going on and everything and um we ended up raising the money in like four days and six hours and then we ended up raising like eighty seven thousand dollars at the end of the month and the trailer got like millions of views on all these social platforms and uh we then the the film got uh finished and then we took it around the country to all these different film festivals and like won all these awards and it really became like a love story you know from like my brother to me and chris did such a beautiful job on it with like his storytelling and just the way it plays it's like an hour and a half long and it, it plays like, you know, like you're watching a real movie and it's just, uh, it's really cool to see it all unfold and how it's still, you know, affecting my life. And my brother kind of left this legacy behind. And, um, one of the people that reached out actually was the United States Olympic committee and they'd seen the film and asked if, you know, I'd consider training judo for the Paralympics and it became, that was in 2017. That was it was a no brainer, and I jumped right on that opportunity and kind of past like five years, you know, been uh, dive like pretty deep into judo and doing all these new things and just all still stuff from the film and being able to speak at different places and stuff. So it's it's a real backstory of that film, you know, how it came to fruition and and where how it is now. Oh, like, thanks for that. Uh, you know the the deep dive in the in the genesis of the of the film and and, and whatnot. The now the I have a question on the on the judo side. So from I mean, judo and wrestling, of course, both grappling sports. And we were talking before the recording about jujitsu as well. Um, the moving from or transitioning from wrestling to judo. I'm assuming the the wrestling wasn't the focus then because. Uh, you're looking more at an, uh, an uh, I guess, a, a Paralympic run, I guess, and that's why you went to judo. And um, is that transition from wrestling to judo, like, do most of your wrestling skills uh, transfer well for judo, or is yeah, it so, you're kind of starting from the beginning again? So, um, actually, the reason I did judo is because there is no wrestling in the Paralympics anymore, which is, you know, very odd because it's like one of the original Olympic sports but that's just the way it is. And they, I started judo and yeah. So like I basically call it wrestling with a jacket on. Um, it's like, cause you wear this uniform It's called a gi and it's like a karate outfit basically is the best way to describe it with the pants and the jacket and then the belt. And you know, the biggest, the biggest learning curve was learning those like arm bars and chokes and stuff and like being comfortable going to your back for a little bit and different things like that but it really translated over pretty well and you know i'm not doing judo to become like the most technical fluid judo player in the world i'm trying to become the best com like competition judo athlete in the world essentially so i'm trying to just win matches you know, in a sh I'm trying to do a lot in a short amount of time because I'm just kind of thrown into it. And, you know, there's people that have been doing it their whole lives. So it's kind of, I have to use what works in a short amount of time. No, that makes sense. So, so the goal is to do a, a run for, for Paris 2024. Is that the, the, uh, the target you have in mind right now? Yeah, right now that's the goal. I, uh, my first goal is Tokyo and, um, I was actually, number 20 like top 20 in the world in my weight class and i was very close like about a tournament away from making it to the games and i had one more tournament in azerbaijan and i was getting ready for it and i was actually fighting some of the best i've ever fought 
and then it's just kind of how life works i the couple days before maybe about a week before the tournament in practice i tore my groin and i was unable to compete for you know a couple months so it was like it was really demoralizing and then you know dealing with that loss and then kind of just losing control of like you you know you can't control that after like that happens so you just have to recover and it's a process so switch the goal to 2024 in paris so it's yes can continue it no that that's fair um just curious what your your training looks like is it just you know i don't want to call it standard judo training so i don't know what that looks like but when you you think about doing a paralympic run you got to you know from my perspective i'm imagining that uh you know you have to amp up the every aspect of of uh training but maybe if you just give a little overview of what that training um looks like because i like to talk to athletes because i always aspire to be one i'll never be one <laughs> but but i was like you know it's just one of these guys like hey, yeah i'll be like those guys one day they're training eight days a week right but i'm just curious what that what that training regimen looks like no so you know it's it's kind of funny because i've learned in my life that like i could lose judo tomorrow um you know just through an injury or a concussion or whatever so like because I've torn my groin right before a tournament, you have, you know, like at one point judo was my life is always doing breathe, sleep, eat judo, you know, and like, um, it was consuming me and it was all I knew. And then I got a really bad concussion outside of judo and I was unable to fight for like months. Right. And then I like realized, you know, I need something else in my life because what if this is gone tomorrow? So, I've kind of smartened up in the sense of, you know, not all eyes, like just all sites just set on that. Like I, I continue to expand my life in other aspects as well and grow in, in other op like opportunities. But my judo is uh, training, like when I'm real in it, it's like, you know, four to five days a week, um, sometimes like two to three times a day in terms of I'll do a workout, like a, a, strength training workout with like kettlebells and stuff on my own and then do like yoga or something and then have a practice either judo or jujitsu so it, when i'm real in the zone that's kind of how it looks and then you know when a tournament is coming up i try and peak like right before that tournament as it's coming up no that makes uh that makes makes a lot of sense and uh and i like the part that you say how you know you, you're all in 110 percent on on judo but all of a sudden life can just throw you a, a curveball and a concussion or whatever and it can all be you know taken away in one foul sweep so to speak so but you you've done well in diversifying your your athletics certainly probably uh, outside of athletics as well um i know we were talking before uh, the recording about uh, about skateboarding and i know that surfing is something that's uh you know a sport that you've um participated in as well i actually had my first co uh, first real surfing experience about a month ago uh, in hawaii it was on the on the bucket list to uh, go with the kids to hawaii and and do some surf lessons and um they thought it was pretty funny and pretty oh, cool that so i can't cool. see where i'm going and i want to i want to go <laughs> i want to go yeah. to hawaii so bad oh there's a, there's definitely some well i mean i was just trying to ride some beginner waves like at waikiki beach right but there's definitely yeah but that's the that best are, yeah. that's uh, sometimes yeah. it's the best it's all you want you know you want it to be mellow you don't want to be like scared out there no fair but maybe can you talk about those talk about surfing talk about skateboarding how did how did these come up because those are not you know obvious sports so to speak and i'll just i'll take a step back for a second so when i've met a lot of other people who are visually impaired and they've uh you know participate in sports as hobbies and whatnot often it's like you know swimming or tandem cycling or you know uh running but with a uh a guide, a guide yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, i've done some of these things as well but when you start branching into some of these other sports um that, you know you start making a name for yourself too right so maybe just talk about uh you know why the interest in skateboarding surfing how did that come about and and if there's any you know specific challenges that you face as someone who's visually impaired compared to uh you know average uh, athletes i guess in these sports yeah absolutely um you know surfing and skateboarding is something that kind of just happened by environment i would say um growing up in a small beach town 
with two older brothers that were just amazing at surfing and skateboarding and like you just want to be around them all the time and i'm also one of my mom is the second oldest of 13 so i have 60 cousins that like all grew up in this same area um so it's it's pretty insane and we all grew up you know surfing skateboarding uh i just wanted to keep up with everyone else like i didn't believe i was blind for a long time and just refused to like i refused to let my blindness be like a, a characteristic i guess you would say i um and I, I used to even like ride bikes around until i started hitting parked cars and then i learned about the tandem bikes and i do that so those things are all great um but you know just be wanting to be around my brother so bad and and kind of you know, just looking up to them so much. I just was always on a skateboard, kind of like rolling around and stuff and, you know, whatever. But recently in the past, like June of 2021, I got invited to meet up with these blind skateboarders in Michigan. And it was just, it was incredible. You know, I learned all this stuff from them and it was cool to see like other people doing it. It was a small handful, but, um, you know, just that, I think I really enjoy these these uh these sports like judo, jujitsu, you know, wrestling, uh skateboarding, surfing, these things where you're like you're kind of challenged yourself, you're right? Like it, it's on you to get better. It's like you can't really rely on other people. Um and it's it's this like mental game where you need to grow. Like you feel uncomfortable all the time when you're doing it and to cut like the more you do it, the more you get comfortable in that like discomfort, if that makes any sense. And it kind of tr just translates over to life. So those sports really, you know, skateboarding, especially surfing, you know, being out in the water, like <laughs> freaks you out, man. Like when you're out on a surfboard and you don't know what's around you and stuff, like I'm sure even when you can see it's, it's like sketchy, but like the things going through my head, like it's just a, it's a, a win when I get calm, like if I get calm out there, you know, and it's uh just constantly, you know, like I said, getting out of that comfort zone and enjoying that space. So it's, and skateboarding is cool because you, you know, it's you and that trick and you're constantly trying it like a thousand times. You get up, you fall like a hundred times, you know, you get up 101 and it's all about just getting back up. And then once you get it done, like once you've, like land that trick it's just the best feeling you know it's it's really cool oh for sure no, I, I, you know and i like you t how you're talking about you know kind of the comfort and the discomfort and stuff too because um I, there's a quote i heard i'm gonna you know butcher the quote but it was something along the lines of you know life begins at the edge of your comfort zone right and yeah when you have a, any kind of disability your comfort zone that circle of comfort narrows pretty fast oh if you it's let it. so like yeah. even yeah. just walking to a store for the first time it's like that anxiety gets crazy so like to to conquer these other things you're like i can do this you know what i mean yeah no i know i know what you mean for sure i mean and, and you know that's one thing i've learned in talking to um a number of people are visually impaired. I've talked to a couple of other um, Paralympic athletes, um, a rower and a, uh, a long jumper, uh, among others. And, you know, it's amazing the you know, people who can uh, really take life by the horns in some of these, um, these ways and, and achieve so much. But, you know, a lot of us have this, <laughs> some of the same, like, you know, uh, struggle, basic struggles in, 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 in a day, right? Like getting around in a new environment that you don't know that well. And, um, I can't tell you the number of like, you know, beers and wine glasses and stuff I've knocked over in my life. And, and you know, I have two little dogs at home and I got to watch that. I don't like, you know, kick them as I'm going down the stairs and stuff. Right. So it's <laughs> last uh, night I'm going yeah, to jujitsu yeah. practice and you would think this would happen in jujitsu, but I'm going to jujitsu practice. I'm like doing something by the car and um, I like open the front door and, and open the back door to let the dog in. And then like go, I close the back door. I go to run to the front of the car, like to run around it. And I forget the doors open. I can't see it. And the, the corner of the door, the top corner, it went right into my forehead and split it open. <laughs> and it's like, 
Yeah. It's yeah. some of these mundane things are like the things that really just suck. Like, you know, it's like, listen, I could fall off a skateboard. I could like fall, you know, get hurt in judo, whatever. All these things are like the thing that really like makes me break down is the door. Like, or, you know, just that, that step you for like missed or whatever. Oh. It's just like, I, I, I can totally relate to that. I can't t- uh, tell you the number of times it's just like a door that's half open and you walk straight into it and oh, that thing doesn't that's move. Worse. just splits open in the eyebrows or the forehead. They yeah, never, it's, it's... They never <laughs> say sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so beyond sports, I mean, you're also a musician. Am I, am I right on that? That's my notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I play uh, guitar and sing as well. Um, actually, during the pandemic, my wife and I went like so – judo kind of stopped right um because of the pandemic and you didn't know what was going to happen with anything like so it was another point in my life where judo's gone so like what do i do and i really focused on music and saw that i was able to like make people smile and stuff during while playing music and get them out of that like covid funk or like negativity that everyone was in and we decided to go, we love to travel and we, you know, we travel all around for judo and stuff out of the country, but we weren't able to fly anywhere. So we got in the car and did a 10,000 mile road trip uh, for seven weeks where we actually branded the whole thing. Uh, it's called Anthony Ferraro's blind busking tour. And we set up in all these beautiful places across the country and uh, live stream music in these like remote locations with like really beautiful backdrops and different stuff. And like, to make people feel like, you know, they're out of their house or like just to make them smile with music and kind of spread like positivity. And it was just, it was a really incredible experience. And that's, that's awesome. That's uh, I love, I love the road trip idea. That's uh that's uh that's pretty cool. And yeah, if I would have known you were a singer, I knew I knew you played music. If I would have known you were a singer, then I would have had to invite you for a jingle on the podcast. But maybe next, oh, maybe next, next time, time we'll get you some, some live performance here. Absolutely. But, uh, you, you mentioned your wife. Um, I read something about your your wedding, which was I think pretty recently, and uh, your wife surprised you with her dress. Do you want to maybe just tell that story a little bit? Oh, it was amazing. My. Uh... Yeah, so we got up married in, on October 2nd in Maine on our friend's property. And it was an incredible, you know, uh, just best day ever. Like, I never really understood when people said that until it happens. And uh, it was just my wife at the time, she, like, was, like, kind of all secretive about the dress. And, like, she was, like, talking to this designer and stuff in Brooklyn. And she's, like all excited you know and and so the day of the wedding she comes up and it's like this whole tactile experience where the dress was like you know all these different textures and like lace and and silk and cotton and you know it fit her like a glove and it was just like because she knew you know wedding dresses can be so like some of them are just for the pictures and like because you know it's you only wear the dress one day your life whatever and it was um some of them could feel like very, you know, I don't know what the right word is, but like cheap or like crunchy or something. I, it's the only thing I can think of. And um, she really went above and beyond in like thinking of that experience for me for when I first saw her when she came down the aisle. Because like I'm seeing her with my hands and, and, you know, it was like, and she's wearing a flower crown. It was just like so beautiful, you know, this dress that she had specifically designed like you know, she went through all these different dresses with this designer and uh, they just found the perfect dress. And it, it was, it really created an image in my head of her on that day. And it was just such an experience. So it was really cool. And then I guess uh, like USA Today got wind of it. And because we made like a TikTok video and it just explaining, you know, I basically just recapped the wedding really short and said something about the tactile dress. And then it became like a huge buzz. And, uh, USA Today, like, got wind of it, and like all these articles happened. It was cool. Oh, that's that's awesome that she yeah that she went. My to, wife to says that. like every bride's dream is to get like their um picture like in a newspaper, like even the local one, like for you know the wedding. And she's like, this is like the most incredible thing ever. Like I, she was so happy. Like it was really cool. Um, you know, because she we had like a wedding picture and all these different we didn't like reach out to any of these uh like networks either it just 
it was kind of like a waterfall effect where like USA Today reached out. I kind of like almost ignored the email. I was like, because I didn't know. <laughs> like, I don't like read too much news and stuff. I try to stay away from like a lot of like, you know, the politics side. And um, it just like, <laughs> I like got an email and I was like, I don't know who they are. And my wife saw it. She's like, USA Today wants to interview about it interview you about our wedding i was like who is that and like it was just really <laughs> funny and then like you know just after they wrote the article i guess like everyone just started writing articles so it was really cool you know it's just that that moment in your life at the defining moment do i just send it to spam or do yeah, I, yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. <laughs> give, give it a few seconds of attention yeah. no that that's that's cool the uh the uh, not 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 quite the same story as yours i i did a uh, half marathon in las vegas with my wife a couple of years ago We've, we've traveled around and do a bunch of half marathons and it's kind of our thing. And, uh, but it was, uh, at nighttime and it was on the strip and, uh, obviously I can't see it very well during the day and at nighttime is even worse. So, um, she, uh, well, she surprised me by putting, by doing a, a wedding renewal. Like they had a run through wedding at this, at this race, uh, oh, or you could, or you could so renew cool. your vows. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a couple miles into the race, you kind of run off to the off the course to this area yeah, and yeah. it was sponsored by some beer company i forget what it was it was miller or one of these guys yeah and it's like everybody had all these beers and and yeah. uh and then everyone's you know, celebrating you, yeah yeah and then you do people some people actually got married and others it was like we were doing our wedding vows and then you got to go back and run the, <laughs> the other 10 oh miles my gosh but, but uh so what she did for me is and she had this little mini wedding dress and wrapped it in christmas lights no and, way uh, so there's like I don't know, 30,000 people running this race and I can't see anything. Right. And it's dark. And yeah, yeah, you know, there's yeah. some areas of the strip that are really well lit and it's of not course. as bad. And there's other areas that are really poorly lit. And, uh, so I just like literally followed this, like lit up Christmas tree in front of me. For, for, oh for, my for, gosh. For, that's so for cool. The duration of the race, it's so, like your yeah. wife was your guiding yeah. light. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, listen, she, I, I married up. I know that. That's for sure. It's the same here. But, <laughs> there you she's go. the best. Um, she's, behind everything you know she does all cool. my filming and editing and it just helped me tell the story and we work together i half marathon i want to do a marathon one day it's kind of on my list but i'm scared to you know address that that part of my list because uh, i'm not much of a runner but i uh i just it's something i want to accomplish i know you can't just do a marathon like i want to do a half one first but like i've done a five mile race a bunch but it's not nothing like that and it's just i really admire uh people that can do that i uh, know but i mean so a half marathon is really not that big a deal if you're doing five mile five miles eight kilometers i, I looked at, i think in kilometers i'm canadian yeah, yeah, right? yeah. but but you're uh you know uh i mean you're an athlete so like it, you know a few weeks a few weeks i just have bad for... knees and it's yeah. just like Running yeah, for me, it in the sucks. Sucks. I hate like running. The, oh, I the hate bad running. Knee, the bad, you're, gonna, you're gonna be fighting in the. In I the know that's why I have to. Dude. I have to like preserve yeah, my yeah. body. Yeah, so you do it after that. You do it after. Yeah, after, exactly. after, after the event. After the yeah, event. I, like I want to do a triathlon. There's all these things yeah. I want to do. Oh, I hear. I hear you. Oh, that was <laughs> a little story from from my side. I don't want to uh, take the spotlight in any way here. I, I can't hold no, a candle please. to what you've done, but we. Uh, after my wife and I were in, um, we were in Croatia in the summer of 20 or, uh, spring of 2018, we did a race there oh, and, so um, cool. we said, let's, you know, let's do something else different as a challenge. And, and she threw out there to me to, uh, to do this, uh, swim, which is like a, a one kilometer oh, no. uh, lake swim. And man, you know, I, I'm, like drowning, sucks. <laughs> I'm like a drowning monkey in a pool, right? Like it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's bad. And, uh, I couldn't do like two lengths of a pool without like stopping and yeah, like, yeah, holding yeah. on. And so, uh, and, but she like, you know, she pushes me, she's pretty good at pushing me to the edge of my comfort zone, uh, in many ways. And, uh, so she's like, oh, fine. If you can't do it, I'm like, wait a minute, I can do that. <laughs> Just uh, like, what do you mean? I can't do it. Reverse I didn't psychology. Want to, but now you're telling me I can't do it. So I accepted the challenge and then, uh, trained for that. And then, uh, you know, our I don't remember our exact time, but it was terrible. Uh, she just like <laughs> breaststroke the whole time. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I'm going like, you know, I mean, it's an open water. Yeah, swim you're like doggy paddling. Uh, like... No, 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 I, I'm, I'm swimming. I'm doing, you know, I, I did some, I, I did some lessons. I got, uh, I did some, uh, lessons prepare for this and, and oh, practice wow. a lot, but, but yeah. just the, even the, the open water for me, like it was like, Oh, it's a whole really, new vibe. Yeah. It's, 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 it's crazy. Like, but it was it was empowering because after that like, i got out i'm like man i 
am totally comfortable in open water now. Like I know I'm not going to drown. Like just cause I'm out, you know, and it's a hundred feet deep. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, That's 10 the feet thing or about feet. Yeah, yeah. getting out of your comfort zone doing these things. It's like you learn something new about yourself every time. No, for sure, for sure. And it's just it's it's confidence building, right? So absolutely. Um now, did you mention your wife? I just want to kind of uh, come back to one thing here uh, or move on to one thing before we before we wrap up. I've taken a lot of your time, but you mentioned your wife does a lot of your videos and editing and whatnot. Um, you have a pretty significant social media following. So I was just hoping you can talk about that a little bit. How did you how and why did you start to build a presence on social media? And, uh, you know, do you have any common themes or messages that you try to get across to the, to your audience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, social media kind of started, um, you know, when the film happened and everything, like I'd go to these film festivals and I just started my wife, uh, we just started dating at the time. So it was like 2018, the beginning of 2018 uh, our first date was actually um, <laughs> our my film premiere in New York City, so I like I asked her to be my date and stuff, and it was like you know just we had an amazing time and um, we just continued the relationship and continued to talk and grow and and all this stuff and grow closer, and I kept saying um, like when people would ask me at like film she so she would start going to film festivals with me now too and when I would she would see every time like when I was up there answering questions people would ask like oh how can we follow you or how can we support your journey blah 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 and I always said like uh, I have like a Facebook page if you just like look up my name you know like a personal Facebook page and it was like no one could ever find me right and I was like, oh, I have, I feel like I have a story that I can like help people. And I really want to, you know, I really do want to reach more people and try and help as many people as I can. Cause that was, even when I was a little kid, I always just said like, whenever people said, what do you want to do when you grow up? I just would always say, I just want to help others. And it's true. I get the most joy from, you know, connecting with others on a personal level and, and helping people as well. And so she helped me make like an Instagram account and uh, then I made like, you know, YouTube and, and just like a little website and all this simple stuff. And then I, you know, tried to tell my story a little bit in different ways and just kind of kept with the social media. And then after the, I had like a couple hundred followers on Instagram. And then like after the tour we did, the first tour, we really saw that like we can create like a, a plan like to like have a vision and then capitalize on it so and and like new it takes a lot of work and what goes into it so then it gave us this like new confidence and you know i was always seeing these people online and i'm like you know there's people on here like doing nothing like doing like funny stuff and i'm just trying to help others and stuff i don't get it and then she um one day she tried to get me to do like tiktok and I was like, you know, she was like, do like, a, it was during like the pandemic. We were so bored. And she was like, do like a funny dance with your cane. Like it might go viral. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, like I'm never doing that. That's so stupid. You know, uh, <laughs> I like screwed TikTok. Like it's just the stupid app. And I just knew nothing about it. And then I started like researching on it a little bit and like scrolling and listening to videos. And then finally found like other things other than like songs and dances and stuff and like i saw people doing other stuff there's like tons of other stuff on tiktok and i was like you know what? maybe i can do this and like we did a video of just like introducing myself and kind of you know like saying who i am and what i do and stuff and then i went to sleep i had like 30 followers and like the video had like 100 views and then I woke up and it was like at like 30,000 views or something. And like, I had like a thousand followers and I was like, wait, what's going on? And then like all these people with like all this like amazing, you know, feedback saying like, dude, thank you so much. Like you're really helping me. You're inspiring me. Like all this like really, really positive stuff. And people just wanted to learn more and know more. And, and we're basically using my content to like help them. And it just be, like continued to grow. We started, you know, we made that that social media plan, like I said, when we got back from the tour. And it just started like a waterfall effect because I had like two years, three years of content that like 
no one's really seen before because I didn't have that following. And then, you know, people just wanted to start learning more. And then it, the waterfall effect kind of happened where people start like finding all your other stuff. And then uh, now it's just the way it's like kind of manicured into like, we have our style of like, you know, doing videos. We have our style of like telling stories and especially in short form because, you know, people's, getting served so much content a day that their attention span can only hold so much and it just it really it's kind of overwhelming all the growth and how fast it's been and you know just the positivity there's to listen with positive like all the with all the growth and like fans and friends and stuff like it it brings a lot of like negativity and haters too so there's always dealing with that but you just have to stay positive, kind of ignore it. And like, you know, my biggest message to people is like the only disability is a bad attitude, you know, with whatever you're doing in life and, you know, just do it with, do it well and like put your all into it. And, you know, just really uh, like live your life and don't let these stigmatisms or ob obstacles hold you back. Like there's always a way to figure something out, even if you have to do something differently, you know, um, just to motivate others and make people laugh along the way and just bring joy. And, and hopefully that will spread that joy to like the next person. And instead of like this negativity online, you know, where people are putting people down and, you know, all these like trolls, keyboard warriors or whatever you want to call them. It's like kind of, you know, overpower that in the sense of spreading this positive message online and just getting, making it contagious. You've certainly done a done a good job of that, because um, I think uh, I think the last time we checked, you're at like several hundred thousand TikTok followers, if I'm not mistaken, and then your Instagram is uh, grown like wildfire as well, right? So you've certainly uh, you've certainly uh, walked the walk, I guess, <laughs> in, in in trying to get a message out to a to a broader audience. It's like I feel like this is the you know this is probably a book coming out at some point. Like I don't know, like is this is this on I suggested that to you? I, I hope one day um it's definitely I, I want to start writing more that's actually one of my goals um but you know hopefully one day I can just have someone help me uh me and my wife have talked about doing something in the future uh definitely a book is in my life is going to happen it needs to but uh I don't know you know just working hard every day no that's well that's that's, that's good well maybe the maybe the that book will come after you, you meddle in 2024, right? And <laughs> yeah, then, uh, yeah. Just another chapter to add to the, to exactly. add to the, to the life story, right? So now listen, Anthony, this is, this has been fun. I appreciate uh, you taking the time to chat um, for people who are listening to this um, other than going to your personal Facebook page, <laughs> where can they, where can they find in social media? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so everything's on my website. It's on asfvision.com. Um, like all my handles across the board is ASF Vision. And then I also actually um, with my friend who's a, a blind skateboarder with, uh, he actually has RP as well, uh, Dan Mancina. He, we started a podcast together as well called Four Bad Eyes. Um, you know, just two guys talking about their life stories and just giving certain anecdotes of how we've dealt with things in life and pushed through obstacles. So there's that as well. And it's, that's four bad eyes.com and all my stuff's there. So thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate you having me on here and just being able to talk and uh, what, you, what you're doing here. Listen, the pleasure's mine. Thank you. And that concludes today's episode of the broad eye podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Of course, ratings and reviews are always welcome. And you can certainly share this episode with any of your colleagues or friends who might enjoy it. Thanks for listening.